to kick off part two of our afternoon here, we have Susan Wollner, who is the Patient and Caregiver Support Coordinator and Community Manager for the Mercy Health Howenstein Neuroscience Center in Grand Rapids. Susan is a certified patient advocate. She's committed to improving patient and caregiver health care experiences while also acting as liaison to providers throughout the state. In addition to her job with Mercy and her role on the MGMI Board of Directors, Susan is a loving wife, a mother of three boys and three very adorable fur babies, and like it or not, she is the person that I want to be when I grow up. Well, until I met Esther. Now you might have, now you might have some competition. <laughs> there is no better person who could be talking to us about building our support team. So here to tell us what we need to know is Susan Wollner. So it's an unenviable position of after lunch. So um, I'm going to try to keep you uh, entertained and awake um, so that we can get the next person on. Is that loud enough? Yes? Yeah. All right. Um, I know some of you. Um, I was here last year, uh, so I may have met others and probably forgotten. Sorry about that. Um, I have been involved with uh, neuromuscular illnesses and MG for the last 30 years. So I um, first got involved because I had a family member uh, diagnosed with MG uh, at, at, from a, a doctor who was a general neurologist um, and not a neuromuscular neurologist. That's an important distinction I want to make today. Uh, subsequently, he, when he went to a neuromuscular neurologist uh, or neuromuscular physician, it was found out to be ALS. Um, and he passed after three years. And we, I was primary caregiver for him. I had a one-year-old son when he was diagnosed. Uh, and my, he died before my son turned four. So, um, it takes a good doctor to know the difference between a lot of illnesses. Um, and one of the things that that always makes me think about is the roles that those clinicians play in helping us navigate where we are and who does what. And a lot of times um, when I talk to people who are admitted to our hospital uh, who may be in crisis, um, there were things along the way where they realized something was wrong and either they were relying on somebody who had a role that maybe that was not their strength. So each of you has different um, support uh, community. So think of yourself as a center of that support community. Everyone's caring for you. It's all about us, as it should be. <coughs> the people that are around there, including your dentist and your uh, neuromuscular physician. You might have a general neurologist um, that might be in this, the, the town that you live in. Um, it might be um, your pharmacist who play a real important role in our lives of making sure we get our medication on time. We might let them know about some of the other things that we're experiencing um, that might be uh, side effects from medication and it may not be. It might be interaction for medication. So all those people fit into that care network. So this is the presentation that I give at some of my support groups. Um, and now I do support groups for um, Hounstein Neurosciences. We have 19 programs in neurology. And in terms of the um, support groups, we have 32 support groups that meet every month. We also host the Myasthenia Gravis uh, organizations, support groups at our center. Um, so this is kind of a general across building support. This, this is specifically to um, my and Gravis. All right. Okay. Uh, disclosures. I am using our Mercy Health slide. I have to do that. My clinician, clinicians, Dr. Gosen is speaking later this afternoon. Uh, he's a doctor. He has the ability to have a blank slide deck because my role specifically with the community at Mercy Health, I'm required to use this slide deck. 
Um, I care for people outside of the patients at Mercy Health. Uh, my support groups allow, you know, you can come to them um, as long as you're somebody with that illness uh, or a family member, you can come to them. You don't have to be one of our patients. Um, so that's, uh, Mercy Health pays me. I'm not paid by patients and I'm not paid based on people come to my support groups. I am a board member of the Mycin and Gravis Foundation um, and they do not pay me. I have no other disclosures, uh, nothing having to do with anybody else that pays me for what I do. So you probably have heard this advice, and this may be your face after somebody hears you have myasthenia gravis and they say, hey, I heard about your MG that literally no medical professional in your city has experience with. You should try, insert advice, diet, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, what was it? Yoga. Yoga. Uh, essential oils is another one I heard of. Anybody else have any? Herbs. The herbs. Okay. These are all what I consider, consider um, unsolicited advice that sometimes we have to deal with when we have a chronic um, illness. And there's really no other good way to deal with it other than perhaps the space and how, we, how you, you're, you're like, keep my mouth shut so other things don't come out, but only you know what best happens with, with your disease. In fact, if I had two of you standing side by side, two of you with MG standing side by side, you have completely different illnesses and completely different things that are happening to you and ways that the medication is working for you. Even some medication may work for you, but not for others. Those are important things, and sometimes this is really annoying. Um, it's really, really annoying. I have a son who has two autoimmune conditions, um, of which one of them is Crohn's disease. And um, if you know anything about Crohn's, it's a chronic IBD condition that is also autoimmune. And people have told him, well, why don't you just go out of the bathroom and not stay in the bathroom anymore? <laughs> and he's like, well, gee, I wish I thought of that. I can't do that. So these are all unsolicited things. And sometimes those are things that kind of get under our skin. But kind of having this plan of advice, of who you're going to take advice from, but also who, how, what you're, how you're going to answer with this. And one of the other people in one of my other groups said, I just say, you know, I have the best professionals working for me. And I'm going to trust them to help me decide what I need to do. And that's the best professionals are yourself. They might be your family unit. They might be a peer mentor. So somebody like Esther, who's wonderful, who helps people stay on the, um, the straight and narrow, especially if you're trying a new drug. It might be somebody like <laughs> Sally O'Meara. You might be uh, you know, having experience with weakness um, and your BiPAP might not be working, or you don't yet know about Trilogy. Uh, Sally, being a nurse, is a fantastic reference for that. Peer mentors are definitely something that we try to connect at our center for people who have other diseases. So the objectives of what I'm going to talk about is um, get the most care most conversation with your care providers and kind of steering them what you need to provide with them, the roles of those medical carers, the roles of yourself, and then also provide information, uh, providing information. What do you need to provide to your dentist? Um, and where do you get that information? Um, secret is it's on the, the website, it's on our website, mgmi.org, mg-mi.org. That information, we have an assets area or a references area that has a lot of that information on it. So, understanding roles. There are probably more on this that I have not listed. Um, if you see something that's not listed that you want to shout out, please add in. Physicians, these could be neurologists, they could be your um, PCP, because all of us have to have one of those, because that's how we get referrals elsewhere. Um, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, psychologists, social workers, maybe ABA therapy people, uh, nonprofit organizations like MGMI, uh, friends and family, peer mentors, and then the role of your own self care and, and you as the captain of the ship. So, neurologists, 
it's important to know that they're, they're really trained to diagnose problems. So, you know, when they have you run through that, uh, this test and, and all the things that they might do, uh, Dr. Glisson, if you, as a neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, looking in your eyes to see what he sees as part of your illness, those are all things, they have a specific role. Um, one of the roles is figuring out new symptoms. So you are experiencing uh, weakness where you've never had weakness before or it's exacerbated weakness that you haven't had and you're wondering you know, what's going on. That would be something that a neurologist would do. Um, guidance about your future. Um, I put this asterisk here. I edited it to put this asterisk because we don't want the future um, recommendations like Lisa had of, you know, you're not going to be able to do anything, get a wheelchair, and you're going to be severely limited. I have never heard our clinicians uh, say that. In fact, I work with clinicians all over the state and other health systems. I've never heard those clinicians say that bad news. What they will say is where you are now, there might be some other bumps in the road or there might be some other things we want to help you manage. Make sure we know about them in order to help manage them as they're going on. And, you know, make sure you communicate with the portal um, immediately when you're experiencing something. Our, generally, they're going to tell you, yeah, that maybe isn't your MG, or it might be your MG, and let's take a closer look at that. So those are things that a, a neurologist does. They definitely help in managing a mindset crisis. You want them on your team, and you want them to be able to help you out there. Um, how to manage disease and impact on your life. They're actually pretty good about that, or they have team members like their social worker or social work team that would be helpful in um, giving guidance about things you might be experiencing, mobility, um, helping you uh, get at no cost to you um, mobility devices. Or one of the things that we have for people who attend our center is we have assistive um, communication devices that if you can't make it to the library and you're still reading is your passion, that's what keeps your mind occupied. Um, we want you to continue to do that because it's so important to you. And we would essentially have a device that we could give you if you would not otherwise be able to afford one. If you had one, we would make sure you had the apps to do the reading and have access to the Library of Congress, complete library of everything that's ever been published. And we would also make that available to you. Um, if you couldn't click or hold the device, we would make it so that it could read it to you. So we had somebody who was, um, and actually had a mindset crisis, um, very, very weak in terms of the lower body and upper body. Um, his passion was uh, reading. He was such an avid reader that the Library of Congress, or the Bookshare, which is the program run by the Library of Congress, uh, allows you to read 30 books a month. Most months have 29 to, one month 29, but uh, 30 days. So you think, that's a book a day. That's a lot of reading. But for him, it was his escape from what he was experiencing. It was such an important escape that he would read a book a day. Um, in fact, there were some months where he exceeded that 30 books, and he called me one day and said, um, you know, out of breath, he said, can I get another book? And, you know, I looked on his account and saw that he read the maximum 30. I made a simple call to Bookshare and said, listen, uh, this is a person we want to make sure he has a cap at 35. Um, they, it's a simple setting for them. Uh, they were able to do it, and, you know, his passion <coughs> continued to the end of his life of reading. Um, I, at, one, at one point I logged the number of books he read in the time, the five years that he used Bookshare from us, and it was uh, close to 1,200 books. Um, it was an important passion for him. He read authors, you know, he would start with the one book and then work his way through the, you know, book 19, um, you know, from some of the authors. Louise Penny, uh, if you're familiar with her books, he was an avid reader of his, her books. They're mysteries, so it was kept his mind occupied. Definitely important. If that's what you li like to do, we want you to be able to do it. Howard talking about golf and talking about the things that he wants to do. 
whatever's important, we want you to be able to do it. And that's an important part of you self-managing what you have. Last thing is, um, you know, managing disease impact on your life and then guide on lifestyle adjustments. Um, that advice of um, a diet that you should use. Um, for some people, uh, an anti-inflammation diet has worked. Would it work for you? Hard to know, that'd be something you'd have to ask your physician about, um, whether it's an option for you. We have a, a ketogenic clinic that actually um, uses that diet. Um, it's run by one of our clinicians in our epilepsy center, and that has worked for some people, not everybody, and certainly it's a it's a, uh, one of the harder things to do for yourself if you decide to go ahead with that type of therapy. But it's important if that's something that you've tried everything else or you think you've tried everything else, you know your neurologist would be one that you would talk to about this and say what are some other non um, pharmacological therapies that I could use that would help with what I'm experiencing? So that would be one question. Nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, um, they pretty much do what the neurologist does if there's somebody who works at the neurology center. Now, nurses and uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants kind of inherit the, this place that they're working. So if they're at a PCP office, they generalize to what a PCP would do. If they're at a neurologist's office, they generalize to what um, that neurologist would do. And they're overseen by a neurologist if they're at a neurology center. <clears throat> if they're at a PCP, they're overseen by that PCP. So again, they're figuring out new causes, new symptoms. Sometimes they're the front line. They're somebody who you can get an appointment with quicker than you can get an appointment with your neurologist. So if you're experiencing something, but you, in your mind, you think, I have to go to the neurologist, one of these people at your neurology center are pretty good, and we don't want you to go too long with experiencing what you're experiencing, and they're gonna consult with the doctor anyway. So if it's important for you to be seen quickly, these are probably people that you want to try to get in with immediately. Um, managing my snack crisis, they will be the same people um, that visit you on the floors, uh, make sure the medication that you, you're being given is working, um, talk about you know what's next for you as part of this. Um, communicate with your family. So that's one thing I know that they do very, very well is you know, try to get your family all on the same page if you're having this um, time when you're in the hospital and try to make sure that that information is communicated in a way, with your approval obviously, um, that helps them put a plan together of kind of what's next for you and when you come home, everything that needs to be in place. Again, guide and lifestyle adjustments um, to help quality um, and life issues. Those are all things that they kind of interlap with the um, neurologist, um, but definitely on their own. Primary care physician, if I could point to one thing where people who have myasthenia gravis um, try to navigate this and sometimes with um, poor effects is maybe they don't get a referral to a specialist. They don't get a referral from their PCTP to a neurologist quickly enough, or there's not a way that they have been communicating with their neurologist to get that referral to, or that PCP to get a referral to a neurologist. It really does require a PCP who is willing to learn as part of the process and learn about your illness and learn about what you know about your illness, because guess what, you have a master's in your own illness. Nobody else has that master's degree in your own illness. Generally, there's a letter that would go to your PCP, you know, from your treating neurologist that would tell about the treatment plan. If not, that's something you can provide. You can make sure your neurologist has these notes as part of this in order to make sure they're on the same page. So, neurologist is gonna do cardiac care, they're gonna do your, um, your blood pressure meds, they might do your, um, cholesterol medication, they're gonna swab your throat if you think you have strep throat, they're gonna make sure your immunizations are up to date. Um, 
Anything else that you found a PCP does really, really well? They don't handle crises. They don't. Not in a way that would get you the most care other than saying, you know, you need to go to your neurologist or the, the emergency right away. In general, they're having staff that is fielding these um, portal messages or, and those layers of people who would touch that before you got to the real information, they got that to the person who would steer you in the right way, you've lost precious time. And, and that's something that you want to make sure that you know that this is one area where that's probably not the strength of your primary care physician. And usually your primary care physician would tell you that. If they're comfortable managing um, myasthenia gravis, then absolutely that would be somebody I would call. But, you know, ask that question. That's a question that's fair for you to ask. You know, how are the, uh, how are, what's your comfort level of managing myasthenic crisis or myasthenia gravis? If they say, there's no words, but you know, it's kind of like, you probably, that's a good indication that you, you want to say, then what would be some, how would I communicate that to you in order to get the fastest care? Because you're gonna wanna know that. You're gonna wanna know that as part of that, that relationship. Um, all important, the primary care physician is going to give a referral to other medical or clinical professionals to help you with your symptoms, your quality of life issues, um, and any, anything you're experiencing outside of your other relationships with those other clinicians. Um, if it's a, a social situation that you need a psychologist or a social worker, they can hook you up to that. They can generally hook you up with um, it was, Lisa was talking about having rheumatoid arthritis and also MG, is it, they might need a referral to another specialist in order to handle one or other of those diseases. In her case, she had rheumatoid arthritis first, but then MG second. So that referral to the person who's best to handle the MG would have been something that, that uh, Lisa would have needed to have in order to make sure that she gets the best care. Um, the other things that they can do are finding you social supports. <clears throat> and, uh, in Michigan, primary care providers now have, if you've ever been asked, um, you know, do you, is, is uh, how do they ask this? Are you isolated from other people as part of your disease? That's one way they ask it. So the isolation of not having other people in your home. Maybe you live alone. You have independence. Um, do you have trouble maintaining your independence because of something from your disease? Uh, mobility issues or the built, uh, you know, ability to get out because you feel good or your breathing such that you're able to get out. Those are all things that primary care physicians can help with those referrals, but also those social supports as part of their practices. Um, psychologists and social workers, um, most of you probably have seen one. If you go to a, a multidisciplinary clinic, they might send a social worker in if, if they think you might ask for a social worker. Um, they are trained to help people cope with uh, challenging situations. Um, they are also helpful in understanding how to navigate the community resources. You know, we have people here from all over Michigan. And the resources that are in my community are not the same that are in uh, your community, Howard, or not the same that are in your community. Those are all different. So those connection to those community resources to help with things like mobility or transportation or look, library books, those sorts of things. Those are social workers have all this down, and they would need to know that. Um, that you were experiencing something you needed help with, but they would help you navigate it. They're really also helpful in um, facilitating family communications. So, you know, you know, none of us go enters having my senior gravis without having kind of other things. Howard self acknowledged she had a heart condition, um, and so those are things that those are both really important conditions. 
and each one of them might have things that you need community resources for or support. So whatever the situation is that you're starting, because you're the center, the captain of the ship, you would need to know to talk to a social worker in order to be able to help navigate some of the other things that might be challenging or you might need community resources for. Don't be afraid to say, I need transportation because I, we had somebody recently who wanted to attend a book club. Um, you know, she didn't have family that would help her attend a book club. She also um, had kind of what I would say is a book club that was you know, competitive. I've never heard of book clubs that are competitive. So it was my first uh, foray into this and, and her book club had told her, because she could no longer hold a book um, that, or read because of her double vision, that you know, if she couldn't read the books, maybe she didn't want to come. I was like, that's so mean. That's just, like, that's competitive. So we worked together to try to get her, again, this access to, to Bookshare so that she could stay ahead in advance listening to the book. And so she felt she could contribute to the conversation. And uh, I followed up with her afterwards, you know, to help her download a couple more books. And I said, you know, did you tell them what, how you're doing this? And she said, no, I kept it to myself. And, you know, just for her, that was a point of confidence. The peer interaction with being as part of that book club was really important to her, really important. And it was part of her social setting and so important that she felt she couldn't give it up. That would be too much of a loss. But she also wanted to, to contribute and be part like everyone else. All of us want to be, have a normal life, whatever that is. And her, that was her sense of normalcy that she so wanted to retain. So, you know, figuring out a social worker would have connected, in fact, did connect her to me so that we could provide that support. Um, a nonprofit organization, of course, our own organization, the National MG Foundation, um, MDA, um, but even things that are outside that, so respite care, um, organizations that provide those are things that social workers can connect you to. But nonprofit organizations are, are huge in helping provide good quality information rather than going to Google and then hit or miss. We want to connect you to it quickly. Your, your time is important. Um, last thing is making sleep a priority. And the, the other people that are part of your network, I see a limited amount of time. We started late, so I'm guessing at the time, I've gone 20 minutes, so just want to. Dr. Soyuri is back there. Um, so peer mentors, very, very important. Um, the, the cheerleader, you know, some, Lisa mentioned uh, Esther's phrase of every team needs a, a good cheerleader. And being able to have somebody who knows what you're going through, but still is going to be your cheerleader on the things you want to be cheered for, and then also support you in the things that you might be having trouble with and you need support. Um, I'm going to go back to this last thing because there were two that I didn't cover that I thought I was running late. Uh, Self-care. Knowing and being able to prioritize what's important to you. It's not going to be the same for all of us and it could be your grandchildren and you want to be able to take your grandchildren on walks or you know play with them figuring out how you would need to modify that and how you need to plan that recovery in order to do those things. So working on a, a journaling or figuring out what you would need to do by writing it down, letting it set for a little bit, and then revisiting it and saying, you know, this was important to me when I wrote it down five days ago or a month ago, is it important to me now? Um, and then being able to kind of navigate what's next. Um, Self-care of, you know, what's important to you by the reading or art therapy or the things that you might do in the community. Volunteering is one thing that we just had a patient do. She um, volunteered at a rescue uh, and she had to pretty much wear her trilogy uh, nearly all the time and the rescue said, you know, with you having that on, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, the pet dander and things like that aren't doing any damage. 
and we want to make sure, is there something that you can get in writing that, you know, helps us know that? Sure. Had nothing to do with, you know, what she was experiencing. Also, the machine works on its own and has, you know, isn't, isn't going to malfunction because there's pet dander. But those are all things that are important for the organization. So if volunteering is one of the things you want to do, figuring out a way for you to volunteer in order to do that. Friends and family, um, sometimes family members, uh, even though we think that they see what we're going through, don't always know exactly what we're going through. They don't understand that maybe the fatigue of, you know, it's, it's like a bathtub filling, but the plug's out and it never fully fills up because that energy goes so quickly. So just being able to describe that in order to be able to say, you know, I can't do more than two things in the day, or I have to prioritize this over this, or sometimes there are people who, because they can't, um, can't understand what you're going through and you have to limit contact with them because it's unhealthy for you in order to be able to do what you're doing effectively or you limit contact to the times when how many people have this family member a couple yeah so toxic toxic individuals where they we love them because they're family it's just hard it's really hard so those are the people that you might say, I am strong enough during these times to be able to handle that person. And I also know my limit, set your watch, set your phone, whatever. Time's up, gotta go. That's just how it has to be in order for you to protect what you need to as part of that. Um, so self-care, what are some other things that people have found about for self-care that you, you, know, you prize and you heard about it through another organization, Peer Mentor. Um, Esther just, oh, Esther's back there. Um, Esther, do you have any recommendations for self-care of the things that you found that have worked for you? Um, probably like Lisa. So you, you make alternative uh, choices. Um, you got to take care of your own body. Right. Prioritization and knowing uh, that you might not feel it's time's up until time's up. So making sure that you kind of back that off or yourself, give yourself <clears throat> enough time to get home. We recently had a, a, a patient who had been out. They were, had been hospitalized this is three weeks. They went out for lunch. They thought it was going to be an hour lunch. They had an hour lunch, and then they could not drive themselves home. That's reality. So then what? Um, that's where us, they call the social worker. We provided transportation uh, and then a family coordination in order to pick up her car. That's real life. You, you, you can't be embarrassed about saying that, but you know for the next time that maybe half an hour lunch might have been good. Even for going on a day where you really feel your best. Uh, or having them come to your house for lunch. So those are the things you have to prioritize. Um, in summary, the hospitals have vast numbers of um, support programs at their fingertips. However, unless we know you need that, we don't apply them to everybody. So if they find something you need, like technology, um, technology to speak, technology to be able to communicate with a family member on the other side of the world, uh, those are all things that we have uh, programs to address. I know a lot of other centers have them. Um, if they don't, I'm sure you'll, they'll work their way to the, some of the programs that I run at my center. Um, but it's important for you to be able to feel confident in the things that you're doing and that self-care enough that you should have the things that you need to. Sometimes it takes a little time. MDA, I think, if you, need, if you get equipment from the MDA right now, they're on like a three month, a three week lab to be able to provide that equipment because of transportation. So know that it is maybe going to take connections to a couple people, but then also being able to work towards that and figure out an interim solution for the things that you might be experiencing. Thank you.